Bienvenidos al ciclo especializado de formación. Welcome to our source cycle on health, work and stress by Sura Prax, uh, the Center for Social Epidemiology and Universidad de los Andes. First, it's a pleasure to have you in this four talk we have for today. Please remember that the cycle is going to have four thematic access and conferences, nine experts from four countries, and is the equivalent to 15 hours of formation. Today, we're going to have around 1,500 participants from 700 companies uh, that come from 100 different economic activities. And we hope that with the knowledge you're going to acquire today in this cycle, we can impact positively the conditions of health and well-being of around 600,000 workers. Recuerde que usted puede participar con remember, you can participate with your comments, your ideas, your reactions through the option of chat. And if you have any questions for our facilitator today, our guest today, please use the option of uh, questions and answers. This training is going to be in Spanish, so you don't have the need of activating the uh, option of simultaneous translation. During the event, Dr. Viviola Gomez is going to be reading all of your questions that you write in the module. And in the last 30 minutes of the conference of the talk, uh, he's going to transmit these questions to our guests so that he can answer them. We may take attendance at the end of the event. We've changed the methodology so that you can be relaxing and paying attention. At the end, you will find the access to the assistance through the chat. And if you cannot do it during the event, you can do it later on on the memory page. And in the following days, you can do so, so that you uh, can be just concentrated on listening to the training. Please remember that all of our trainings are going to be in the memory pages a couple of hours after the event ends, so that you can repeat the video and, and share it with other people if you want. Without further ado, I am going to hand the floor to our colleague Viviola Gomez from the Commission in Stratton Health of Los Andes. She's a leader of the pedagogical proposal of this cycle, and she's going to introduce our guest today. Welcome, Viviola. Thank you, Sebastian. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me having this as a guest today, Dr. Arturo Juarez Garcia, my colleague and also, fortunately, my friend. Arturo is a teacher, a professor of University. Right now, he works in the Center for Research in Psychology. He is a psychologist and a doctor from the National University of Mexico, and he has investigated research and published on these topics for many, many years now. He has very important interests in this area. He has published books and articles. He has been acknowledged by international organizations as someone who has made a lot, a lot of um, in inputs to this topic and the world knowledge about this. He has also worked with the Mexican government trying to collaborate in the design of a law, I understand, if I understand well, Arturo, to regulate measuring, evaluation, and prevention of psychosocial factors in the country. I don't know if uh, he's going to have um, the chance to mention this briefly, maybe not, we won't have enough time, but, but I just wanted to tell you and let you know that he has a lot of experience on this topic in general, and also in particular on a topic he's going to mention today, which is burnout. He has researched and carried out work with colleagues in Latin America that allow him to have a very broad vision of what is happening with this problem, how it's related to the psychosocial working conditions in our subcontinent. But particularly, what are some of the difficulties on evaluating and inter in interventions for these types of problems? 
So without further ado, it's my pleasure, Arturo, to have you here with us today and I hand you the floor so that you can share with us. Thank you, thank you, Viviola. Uh, I am deeply, deeply thankful for the invitation to this event. I want to congratulate you all for this platform, for continuing to promote the importance of these topics in a region, because we really need this in, in Latin America. And uh, it's an honor, really, for me being able to participate with you in this series of talks with so important with colleagues who are so important that have contributed as much to this topic in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Arturo. Okay, so Arturo, you can go ahead and share your screen so that we can uh, look at the presentation. Okay, can you see it fine? Yes, you can see it, please. We can begin. Thank you very much. Okay, so I... I'm going to talk about this very important topic that nowadays has been one of the most popular topics when we talk about psychosocial risk and that has to do or is linked to work stress. It's called burnout syndrome, a modern myth or an underrated problem. So this presentation is the product of a very important reflection I did uh, because I asked myself, what should I share with you? Because uh, I know that there is a lot of information online and in the media about burnout as a risk for health and a risk for diseases in general. And so I thought, well, maybe I should do something a little bit different that what you can find uh, available in social media and uh, in YouTube. So I think something we really need is a critical approach so that we can really have an exact balance of what we know about burnout syndrome and in particular in a region in Latin America that is going to be the focus of my presentation and I'm going to end with some reflections for you for the prevention and interventions. So I was mentioning it's one of the most popular topics. Currently, we have up to 19 different denominations in Spanish or this word. So I decided to just leave it as burnout in English because I found, I found a lot of translations. So sometimes we don't even know if we're talking about the same phenomenon or something else. This is one of the reasons why I, I left the name in English to, so, to know, so that we can know what we're talking about. From the 80s on, it's one of the most popular topics. Uh, as I said, you're going to find articles, theses, presentations, radio, television about this topic. So if you just want to have a, an idea, Google the word job burnout, you're going to have more than 70, 70 million documents. So you can have an idea. OK, so where does this begin? Well. In, in novels, like in Shakespeare, you may find the, find the, the, world, the word burnout from the psychosocial sphere. The first study was in uh, 1953. It was Schwartz. He studied uh, the case of Miss Jones, uh, a nurse. And it seems that this is the oldest study we could find on the topic. And uh, the moment where we had a, a real breakthrough was in with Christina Maslach in 1981. She was an investigator in Berkeley, California. She uh, has already retired, but she started uh, very interested in a psychological phenomenon she found in organizations of um, human resources, people who work with other people, who uh, give services to other people. And what she found, was that these people had a depersonalization, a cold treatment, and the linking uh, emotionally from the other. And that phenomenon was also a part of a, a self-defense uh, method, not engage 
personally with your with your students so that we can move on right so she investigated this phenomenon and in her interview she found that the psychological state the same participants that she studied uh, they refer to it as burnout so she decided to use that concept uh, of burnout because the, the people themselves were reporting it as so so she mentions the, the, the reference of a flame being consumed being turned off so it's a feeling consumed where once there was fire now there is a burnout of energy that was her analogy and this brings us back then to the stress studies and the father the famous father of stress who was an austrian um, doctor hans surgeon he documented and generated a model to be able to understand the stress response which is a non-specific response vis-a-vis uh, -vis the demands of the body and the mind. So this model has three very clear phases. First, there's a stressor that generates an alarm response, so it's just a a second stage of resistance. And then when the stressor goes on, uh, because of intensity of, because of frequency, continues to be present and it is chronic, then there's a third stage, which is burnout. We run out of resources to make front to that demand, and that's where burnout comes. This model was created in the physiological field with a biological focus, but the tendency is very similar from the psychological point of view. People have a first stage of alert, and resistance and then when the stressor becomes chronic uh, you have a sensation of burnout where you no longer have the resources to cope with the demands that that stressor has and people start feeling uh, burned down so this process that coincides with the logic of burnout uh, it, it has certain characteristics that with the review of literature of 35 years later, Shofeli later and Maslach herself, they review it and they concluded that talking about the definition, it seems that generally there is a consensus that has five, uh, that the phenomenon has five characteristics. First, that you have dysphoric symptoms, so it's negative. We have to highlight this because some people say that burnout can be positive that the entire can be good. But we're not talking about a physical tiredness. That is the second element. It's a psychic tiredness. Uh, third, it's a work phenomenon. It doesn't apply to other spheres. Now it's being studied in, in, stud, in students, but really this model was for working people. And another important point is that its symptoms are observed in normal individuals. And it's not a pathology. It's a psychosocial alteration, but it's not a disease. The last point is that the effectivity and performance of people decreases. That's consensus. The World Health Organization very recently in 2019 included burnout, although I must say not as a disease, it includes it as uh, a factor that can influence health as a uh, working factor, but not as a disease. And so they say it's a syndrome that has three symptoms. First, uh, that burnout feelings of people feel tired, but it's a chronic tiredness. It's not something that you can repair with a night of sleep or uh, resting throughout the weekend. No, you can't recover from this. Number two, there is a mental distancing from work that is characterized by negative feelings and indifference towards the people you work with or towards work itself. There's a negative attitude. You no longer have this willingness, this compromise, uh, commitment to working. And finally, you feel your performance is reduced. You feel you're no longer doing your work properly. You're not motivated, you don't care. 
So that is a phenomenon of the work sphere, and that's how the WHO recognizes it. The most important way to evaluate it is through a filtering. So we have to explore the symptoms through self-report. We find we use questionnaires and tests to evaluate it. And from all of the options that are available, the most popular one is the mass lack of burnout inventory, MBI, which is the most uh, famous instrument tool. And uh, even 90% of research on burnout has been carried out with this instrument. So talking about burnout is talking about this instrument. It's a reality and that has some advantages and disadvantages that I'm going to mention later. So uh, up until today, we have shown that burnout is associated with different aspects of workers, emotionally, uh, attitudes, cognitively, psychosomatically, and also, also I highlight at organizational level. Yes, of course, uh, performance lowers, there's a high rotation of personnel, there are more incapacities, more accidents, and more ostentism. So this has been documented. You can find hundreds and thousands, actually, of studies uh, regarding this topic. So this is just an example of variables that you are going to find and uh, where the importance and popularity of this topic lies. So coming to the center of this, it hasn't been a bed of roses regarding burnout. We have also had some polemic, even uh, to the point that today there's a very strong debate between scientists around the world that I'm going to mention. And it's important, I think, to talk about that. So in this uh, reflection from Latin America, several uh, researchers asked ask ourselves, okay, we know that in developed countries, there are, there is a lot of research. They have answered a lot of questions, but what about us? What is the prevalence? What are the levels of burnout? Are they the same? Are, those, are they different? What sectors or occupations are more vulnerable? What factors are associated to this syndrome? Yeah. Are those the same that in developed countries? How many and which kind of studies have been carried out here in Latin America? What is uh, the scope and the quality of them? So we want to answer this question. Is burnout an exaggerated trend or is it an underrated problem? So several researchers through systemic reviews have tried to answer this question. And I have to say very quickly in a parenthesis here, scientifically, there are different levels of quality of evidence. That's where we have a model of Messina. So it comes from the opinion of an expert. When an expert gives an opinion, that can be some sort of evidence of validity that the phenomenon may have. And the most important that is systemic reviews. So please see that in second place, we have randomized, randomized uh, clinical trials, which would be like intervention studies. Those studies that are carried out to prove a measurement or let's say a way of solving a problem and approve its efficacy. So those are the most important levels of evidence, of the scientific evidence that allow us to confirm if something is relevant, important, if a measure works or not. So thanks to this model, the advanced, scientific advance in, in health is as, as important as, as the COVID vaccine, for example, which in a record time, we were able to create the vaccine thanks to a platform based on this. So now the balance in Latin America, well, in a lot of studies, Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia have led scientific production. They all confirm that the tendency is to growth. And something important is that 60% of investigation has been carried out in health professionals, in health healthcare professionals, so medical personnel, nurses, etc and on teachers, so it is um, more focused on these groups. And yeah, there are some studies around, um, they are uh, a lot smaller. So this is also relevant because maybe generalization should be so broad. 
Okay, so I was saying we use the MBA instrument. So as a summary, check out the we in the systemic reviews we've done in Latin America, we've seen that quality of research still has some opportunity areas. For example, longitudinal studies that allowed us to identify if something is cost and effect. In previous talks, you heard about these prospective studies with large samples that allow us to make these uh, claims, epidemiological claims with a lot of evi evidence, very, very sound. Uh, for burnout, especially in our countries are very weak. So in Mexico, in Peru, the same, very little studies that prove the validity of the measures that have been applied in index um, magazines and journals. There's very little research, very little intervention studies. So the maximum uh, level uh, based on evidence is very weak. And this is true for many Latin American countries. Look at this. This is uh, another important thing I want to talk about. Specifically in the MBA instrument, the options that come from zero, start from zero. How much do you present this symptom of being tired, for example? So zero, never, up until six a day. So some studies that were of better quality, we found that, for example, the average, the median was around two, which means that once a month or less. That is the frequency which with people report being tired or this symptom. Uh, regarding personal realization, which is a positive variable that we have to codify, it also people tend to be realized. So to summarize, we think that saying that someone has burnout once a month or less um, is far from representing a public health problem. And, and it's still a question because we have to continue to research but the frequency is a lot lower than we thought, at least in our countries. Another relevant problem is that the criteria to determine a case of burnout are very different. And the research some others suggest is certain cut points in others use other criteria to define whether a case would be. So this doesn't allow us to have homogeneity. And if we say, okay, if you say yes to two items, that you feel uh, your frequency is that burnout, but no, some other people say whether if they say that uh, once a week, that is burnout as well. So those criteria don't allow us to have a homogeneous measure. So the criteria really varies a lot. And as I said, this it repeats, it gets repeated a lot. You'll find this in systemic reviews of literature. You will have, we'd have had symposiums, lasers one was in Peru. Between Latin researchers, we agree that in Latin America, we need to improve the quality of research. Why? Because here in the balance, you can see, we cannot even establish prevalence. So you'll find, for example, we've had notes in the media that say 70% of doctors have burnout. But that 70% can be due to the fact that the investigator, the researcher, has some very different criteria from other researchers and that only found 2% or 0% of cases. So that is a true problem. And for example, in the demand control model or the reward, um, for reward uh, imbalance, we, you have seen that these models have been widespread and have a very homogeneous methodology. We don't have that for burnout. So we can have for zero, from 0% 0 to 90% in the same study. So as I was saying, because this has been more studied, uh, more focused on healthcare professionals and in certain regions of every country. So we still have to see how much of this can be generalized to other occupations in other regions. I also talked about the limitations of the tools. You cannot calculate the validity, the trustability, and so that generates doubt. And even though we've found in Latin America a lot of studies that burnout is associated to similar factors that the ones we have in other developed countries, for example, that the 
load of work, that psychological demands are a predictor for burnout, or that the lack of support from your colleagues or your boss is also a predictor for burnout. We also have to improve the design here. We also don't have enough intervention studies. So this contrasts with the popularity of the concept that a burnout house in a region. We would expect to have a lot more research and better quality research, but I think this is more an influence that has come from developed countries. There are other things. You can find an interview in Spanish that Dr. Cristina Masla did online. In Google, you can find it. And you can see, okay, a very important question uh, that I had here is, I asked her, doctor, a lot of people ask if there is a theory that backs this uh, burnout syndrome because it was generated based more on research and tools, but is there a theory? Because uh, scholars are worried about this. And she said, no, I don't think there is one. We are still working on that. And this from the scientific point of view has been criticized or when things are too pragmatic and we don't have a logic underlying the phenomena we're trying to solve. Another irrelevant thing here I want to say is a study, one of the most um, oldest studies that we have in Latin America in 1995 with Dr. Penis and Dr. Hillman, they found something very important. There can be cultural differences. They did a qualitative study where they concluded that it is important to understand and try and treat burnout in a different way for for example, North American workers, blue collar workers, than Mexican blue collar female workers. This was all for female workers because it seems that there we had very important cultural differences. We cannot lose track of this because we also need to adapt and validate models that are applied in developed countries where the culture, the beliefs, the practices, the habits of workers are different from Latin American ones. And so this is a variable that we do have to take into account. Here, I'm going to give you an example for meaning. So the variable of dehumanization of systems that, that we have used it in burnout in English, it has been translated um, to Spanish as cynismo. So cynicism in English, if you analyze it, you'll find that cynicism in English has, denotes more a individualism, more indifference towards uh, uh, everyone else, and I'm more worried about myself that, than on my task. Well, cynicismo in Spanish is more understood as uh, obscenity and they're not being shameful so qualitatively that's different so in spain it has been translated as cynismo but we think it should be translated as indiferencia indifference so another example feeling burnout in spain they have translated this as uh, feeling you're burned by work your work has burned you and a lot of instruments that have been translated to spanish include that work you're burned by your work. And uh, in, in my own experience, when I apply questionnaires in blue collar Mexican workers, for example, I have found that before the data we applied this, and so they were saying, what is this? What do I understand? What does this mean that I feel burned by work? And so I told them, well, tell me what you understand. And they usually 90% of the time told me, well, uh, feeling burned by work is like, is like I, I have a bad reputation on my work. That's being burned at work. So very quickly we noticed that there wasn't only a, a difference for meanings and cultures from the, the English speaking countries, but that even though in the same Spanish speaking world, there was difference with Spain. So culturally, there are uh, very important things. A lot of people also think that burnout is just a, a trend, that MBI is a tool, a questionnaire that has the rights of use and that are the property of an editorial group. And so you have to pay to be able to use it. And so a lot of people are talking about the commercial purposes behind this. 
and there is a lot of good in them, but okay, the option is, well, don't use just MBI. There are other free tools you can use that are available. And so I am going to end this part of the criticism mentioning a current debate that some researchers and very strong groups in, in different countries have been pointing out. They say that burnout doesn't exist. The burnout is the same as depression and that it is being mixed up. And because we don't have an epidemiological sense and uh, it's not very clear, then we need to leave burnout behind and focus more on studying depression. And so these authors observate that it's not clear what a burnout case is, that we don't have any correspondence between what burnout is and how to measure it. So the symptoms are not only or come from work that they can come from other things. And so there's a lack of clarity and that there is not enough evidence that burnout is different from depression. Those are the main criticisms from these authors that have been making a lot of noise and there is an ongoing debate. So here we have to ask the question, uh, so does burnout not exist? Doesn't it deserve some attention? So trying to uh, carry out this balance, we have written a group of researchers and me myself from latin america we've written a letter to the editor participating in this debate saying that we are do not agree with these observations yes burnout is a phenomenon that occurs only in work and only because of work and such as, as the case that any tool of the mba you'll find that 90 95 percent of the questions refer to works to words as work, working, labor, and so you cannot understand burnout without work because that is the way you measure it. Between its main predictors, like, uh, working predictors, we always have for this phenomenon, for this working environment we have. The workload, uh, strict supervision, or as you saw the models, the lack of control, the lack of rewards, those are the main predictors. And we think that, that calling something a case of burnout in place a medicalization of the phenomenon. When we talk about diagnos diagnostics for a case, we are talking about medical things, but burnout is not a disease and it's not depression either because we already have several studies that show that symptoms qualitatively are different, that neuroendocrine uh, mechanisms are different as well. Personality is also associated different with depression that would burn out we have different genetic regulating mechanisms and even the patterns for answers for your encephalogram uh, patients in our patients we can see that they are completely different so we do not think that they are the same and we do have to have um, different differentiated attention we also think that they criticize the tool well they use a tool to criticize burnout but in in our letter we said you are you are mixing up the spade with the hand the sword with the hand mba by itself is just a measuring device just so that we can have indicators of that phenomenon and we can show that depending on the tool you use results can vary and so that it is very important to analyze the validity and reliability of the instruments we use so please be very aware of this and you should use instruments that are adapted to your own culture for example here we have measurements that have been uh, developed that are tools for hispanic cultures and that is very important or if you're going to use another instrument then make it one validated validated one such as uh, uh, effort reward you balance or as the demand control model because they have been proven in Latin America. Dr. Viviola probably is going to talk about this later. And so the bad quality of research is not does not mean that burnout doesn't exist. So if you want to look at this, and MBS, we have validated that. So as I was saying, more than the instrument, we have to focus on the validity of the concept. So don't lose track of this. We cannot deny that we can find a lot, a lot of research in developed countries, especially 
on how burnout is related to a lot of indicators, physiological, psychological, social indicators that have to do with the working, uh, of the life quality of people. And I only mentioned some, but so that you can look about the impact of burnout. We have found that people, for example, nurses that have burnout, uh, the average of days for their patients to cure is a lot longer than in days than for nurses who do not have burnout. So what are the implications for this in terms of cost, investment, suffering for patients, for nurses? The implications, chain implications are immeasurable sometimes. They are widespread. So I think this is not up for discussion. In terms of the prevention focus, burnout is very important. For example, I found this data for Colombia. Payment for prestations and assistance, uh, it has to do with diseases and for mental diseases 49 percent has to do with anxiety and this is important because anxiety presents very high correlations with burnout the 14 percent mixed transfer uh, mixed disorders that are also related to burnout and 13 percent serious stress and adaptation disorders so these disorders in symptoms are very similar to burnout and so their correlations are very high According to Pinto et al, we have spent 400,000 Colombian pesos a year, 400,000 million, because of depression. So this is very important because we are talking about economical consequences because of mental health. So what's relevant here? Prevention. And here is where we have burnout play a role because burnout is something that I have called the orange light of burnout, you can see the process that can start. When you have a healthy adaptation, you have the green light, then you're going to move to second stage, which is yellow, when there is negative stress. So exposure to these risks, so psychosocial risk factors, as you've seen in previous talks, high uh, imbalance between uh, effort reward imbalance and the high demand and low growth, et cetera. So orange is an effect of several from this position that implies a following level of prevention in which we still are for, for health care, for mental health care, we can still revert any damage that has been done. But the red light is when you already have a mental disorder. So what is the difference from between burnout and a mental disorder? Reversibility is a lot quicker. Uh, it requires prolonged uh, treatment. While burnout, we have shown that it's reversible quickly, more quickly, and it does not require pharmacological treatment. So in that sense, it's like a, an orange light in the process of health and uh, healthy mental uh, situation and, uh, and disease, mental disease. It's like the bridge that gaps these two. So we need to not make it medical because we cannot force it or try to make it just the same as depression because it's not the same. It's something that we can revert. Now, in terms of the theory, there is a model of psychosocial well being that can help to understand this better. It's an old model and i think that it can be the mother theory that covers burnout but I, as i was saying this the creators of burnout have acknowledged this themselves and this is very complete theory is one of the, the ones we use the most in current research and it has to do with the combination of two axes so the state of psychological well-being can be divided into how much activation how much energy the person experiences and how much pleasure or likability they are experiencing. So when we look at a situation in which people are experimenting something unpleasurable or something and they have a low level of energy, then we're talking about burnout. 
an, ex an emotional negative experience combined with low energy. So that we can understand the complete model, we need to take into account the opposite, which is engagement, which would need a whole talk by itself, but that is the opposite that we need to understand because that's when people feel energized, they feel the energy, which is a very common phenomenon, by the way, people report they feel energy and they report pleasure and liking their work, the positive sensation, and uh, they want to uh, immerse yourself in your work and you really enjoy it. That's the opposite in this axis. And of course, engagement is a psychological state that it is higher than satisfaction because it implies activation. That someone can be satisfied without being productive, but someone who's engaged is satisfied and is productive as well. And then we have the case of stress when you have an alert because you are uh, badly activated, but it's a negative experience. So in the model, this fits very well, and it's a way of understanding the psychological states through pleasure and activation. So to close my presentation, I don't want to leave aside the topic of COVID-19, particularly in Colombia. Some researchers have said that for this transition to home office, that has been worldwide. In Colombia, between 20 and 30% of workers have changed to this modality of home office. And this has a lot of implications because of course, we can have to say that a good part of companies and of workers wish to continue with this modality. So this is going to imply changes in, in psychosocial exposition, we're going to have new factors that are being incorporated already uh, and that are going to be, become more relevant. For example, the balance between work and family is going to be a, a very important predictor for burnout, right? And we are already finding this, that people who are transitioning to this modality have been also showing more emotional tiredness. Of course, we have this also for health workers because they are the first line of defense for the pandemic and also in people that work on education so teachers and, and these more new modalities to get in part in class that has been really uh, tiresome as well so there's a study in, in america that we are carrying out in hospitals and if you're interested that we invite you to this uh, so far, we have our first court, uh, court and we have found predictors for burnout in hospital personnel from multiple categories, psychosocial categories. So particularly, we found that the fear of being infected, not just for yourself, but for infecting your family, it's one of the highest stressors that is causing more burnout in people. And another a protector factor is support from your superiors. And of course, everything that's behind the workload or psychological demands at a very specific level, we have found them. For example, having more patients to tend to, having a lot of, more, uh, of weeks, having attending to COVID patients, that is also a predictor and also presenting symptoms of COVID or having a chronic disease or losing a family member, close friend uh, or colleague because of COVID, those are variables that are going to have very important prevalence and a link to burnout. So we did this through a mixed methodology. It was very interesting to open in the questions, but you can see that we can already have specific levels. And this can also happen. I always suggest this in uh, our working centers. We can explore uh, standardized tools, stressors that are very specific that can you can have in your company and maybe don't exist in others. So this burnout is going to be the orange light that I can tell something else is going on. So to move to the most important topic, maybe perhaps to close this presentation, we of course have to talk about intervention. What can we do to prevent burnout? Well, we have in Mexico a someone that is very famous, that is Kaliman. Because through their mind, he solved problems 
and could um, he became a better person and became a hero and we had this logic to remember that we have a more um, higher demand of services to reduce burnout and, and here we have a very individual focus to meditate to learning how to relax using your emotional intelligence being resilient and that's the key to defeating the psychosocial risk factors and burnout and then we have other colleagues that have shared this in, in these talks yes that is important and it can help but we have been recommending not only looking at this uh, this phase of the problem we not not looking at a single leaf but also not even a tree but the whole forest Karasek mentioned this, when you have a very specific view, a very reduced view of the problem, that doesn't work, you need to look at the whole forest. And so part of this is understanding the diagnostic methodology and intervention methodology. On the one hand, yes, you cannot have a good intervention that's going to be effective if you do not have a diagnostic. So interventions need to be focalized. I have found, um, as a collaborator in many companies here in Mexico, and a lot of them do these diagnostics and evaluate psychosocial risk factors, but the measure for intervention is a meditation course or relaxation course. So there I, I see an incoherence between the measure they adopt and the diagnostic they receive, because it's like if a doctor through a diagnostic test finds a disease, for example, cancer, and then they formulate paracetamol to that patient. So there's no coherence between the diagnostic and the measure you took. And an analogy is what happens in, in companies. Usually this happens, they do not look at the root causes, they only try to attend to all the symptoms. Before COVID, you find in the literature uh, main predictors of burnout, and you'll find several of these the load of work, low autonomy and your skills, lack of social support, strict supervision by your bosses, social interactions that are non harmonious, that are hostile, um, inadequate uh, reward systems, lack of reward, uh, recognition. So what do you think? All of this is just confirming what we already know in this series of talks, a controlled amount, kind of, a model and the effort reward imbalance model. This confirms the orange slide that from primary prevention, from exposition, we can do this. So in, in a risk map, don't forget that we have to go to the origin, to the source. And here we'll find in Twitter, where I have an account, one of the pictures that have become very popular. It's a column, I don't know if you can see it, it's a column, but it's completely shattered. Structurally, it looks terrible. And it is wrapped around with tape to try to contain it. And so I, I wrote, like when you have several problems because of psychosocial risk in your work and you hire a coach who's an expert in meditation to fix it. So in talks, in previous conferences I did, I talked about the lack of attention to structural aspects and nothing better than this image to show that. We also have a lot of scientific evidence. And just to show you a little bit, we carried out a meta-analysis, which is a study of studies, of intervention studies. We found in the part A, they are studies that carried out organizational interventions and in the lower part in b you're going to find individual studies organizational studies means they did structural changes they assured a better design of work better uh, workloads the workers have the ability of being uh, autonomous and participating rewards that are adequate and leadership, etc. So more structural things. And by individual interventions, we mean mindfulness, 
relaxation, meditation, all of these practices that are more centered on the individual. What do these studies find? You can clearly see that when when the squares move to the left, it's in favor of the intervention. To the right side, they move against the intervention. So when we have organizational interventions, they are all in favor. They are individual. Some, some do. There were mixed results, and there is also a common pattern. Some are on the left, and some are on the right. You can see the ponderated effect can be achieved with organizational interventions and individual organizations is higher. It doesn't mean that individuals don't have an effect. Yes, it does have an effect, but it's lower. And something important here is that organizational uh, interventions have a higher sustainability. The effect lasts more than 12 months, at least a year, but they can be longer. While uh, individual interventions have lasted more than six months, some studies mentioned that two or three weeks later people felt the same again and this is obvious because mindfulness just looks at the symptoms and not at, at the root of the problems we of course are going to have more colleagues talk about in, in further presentations about these they probably will talk about intervention levels we have four individual that of course are important, but the problem is when they only carry out these individual ones. Now at a group level, which are group therapy, reflection groups, we also have a participatory research and at the institutional level, and then at a macro or social level, that is the norms. Something important for us as well is we have to have a strategic alignment with the mission of the organization. The difference between an intervention, a successful intervention, and an unsuccessful intervention has to do with this alignment. Uh, for example, an, an intervention for burnout that can look minor to a strategic mission of a company. Some companies have different levels of maturity to introduce these um, psychosocial risk factors. So we have to start there. If they don't have enough maturity, the management will not care about this and they will not care about a structural intervention. So our first stage is just looking at the maturity and create awareness in management. And number two, we need to align these efforts to that mission. Every, con every company should have a mission that goes beyond making money. Usually their mission implies a social contribution. It's not this concept of a, a social responsibility. So they have to contribute something to society to deliver a product or a service or whatever. And they always have in this mission a human factor that's implicit there. So this human part of the mission, that's where all of the strategies of intervention has have to be aligned. We don't have this alignment. The interventions are not going to work because they are just going to be uh, received as a course to um, lower stress in your workers, for example. But it's not good, not going to be structural. This is the first part, of course, a whole intervention plan. We need to go beyond just a simple course. Course, um, we need to link it with the plans for strategic development of each company. We need to ensure the resources and the support and of course the results, which is the last stage, have to show because this is very important for the high management. Not only that burnout um, actually got lower, but what was the impact of this in terms of costs for the company? And this is very demonstrable. We have a lot of um, work on health economy that has a lot of models to show this. So in general, at the strategic level, I think it's very important to have this alignment. Bear in mind that if you don't have one of these four elements, then the intervention is going to be reduced. So to conclude, definitely we need to uh, back ourselves up in research. 
uh, because research in Latin America is uh, very lacking, then we need to investigate more. And decision makers regard, regarding these topics, I do suggest to go to the research that exists in whatever is documented scientifically. And that, uh, relationship with uh, the scholar area is very important. This is not a medical issue. We have a, the logic of the orange light, remember that, and adapting theories that already exist about, for example, uh, your well-being, mental well-being, is, is a framework that is viable and possible and in, invites us, for example, I also bear in mind the positive effects. And I suggest for diagnosing predictors for burnout can vary depending on the context and the historic situation that we've for COVID each company. So always when we measure burnout, you have to measure your background, the, the causes and the consequences as well. So those backgrounds are going to help a lot because burnout predictions are not the same always everywhere and they are not the same strength either. So for this intervention, I also say in the four levels, try to align it strategically to the objectives in the mission of the company. With that, the top management, any inter intervention is only going to have short term results. And finally, to answer the big question that was the title of this presentation, we think that with the current balance, the burnout is not a passing trend. It's not a myth. And even though it's not a public health problem, it looks uh, as severe, it's not a very severe disease. It is an alteration that is having an important presence and which uh, it's important to prevent as, as an orange light, uh, it's going to help us avoid a lot of diseases and a lot of problems and associated costs. Thank you very much. I am at your disposal in the email and you'll find some pages as well for information and Twitter where I post a lot of information regarding this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arturo. Viola, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Arturo. I have a lot of questions for you. I am going to try to be organized about this. So the first questions are related to the definition itself and the conception of what burnout is. The first question that came up when you were talking about what burnout is, someone asked if it's not a disease, why do you call it a syndrome and why do you use it to, for example, where you can ask a leave from work because you have burnout if it's not a disease. Okay, so there is an imbalance, a lack of adjustment between things that have been legislated regarding burnout and what has been generated. In Peru, we have something similar. In Peru, some of the laws say that you have to apply MBI and the research has not been very solid to confirm that the MBI is the best tool available to do this. So yeah, the legislation may be a little bit um, unaligned. And I think it, we call it a syndrome because it does present some symptoms. And it was called like this symptoms uh, some years ago, which is this uh, feeling of being tired and a negative attitude toward work. They were called symptoms to, to relate it to something that has to do with health. But as I have said, far from being a disease, it is important to diagnose it and it is important to detect it. So I think that it's good for the normative to detect it and attend it. And that was my presentation. I would insist that we do not medicalize it because of course we have this problem. We do not have a clinical uh, chart. The World Health Organization is not including it in the diseases of the world. So like, how can you say if someone is sick or not? And how do I attend to the law? So it's an area of opportunity. But if we focus on this, 
alterations that people are feeling. And if we look at this, look at it from the prevention point of view, I think it's that's most important to move forward. Arturo, a lot of people seem to have missed the difference that I I think you try to make make throughout your presentation because people are asking. What is the difference between stress, burnout, anxiety, and depression? Some people don't see the difference how you diagnose this uh, differentially. And finally, something that has to do with it is if someone could fake burnout. Excellent question. There are some characteristics that I highlight different from clinical charts. So stress, for example, we have a series of alterations that people have around stress, that our hands sweat, we have, we, we feel butterflies in our stomach, we have a palpitation that grows. Uh, this anxiety can be acute, for example, it can be just passing, it can be momentarily, it can be a momentarily stress that lasts, for example, one day, but burnout talks about something chronic. Stress, uh, we have resources that we can cope with it. And once the demand uh, lowers, we come back to our homeostasis state. But for burnout, we cannot do that. We cannot recover. There is a chronic tiredness and a lack of energy and it's a negative energy attitude towards the world. So it's a more stable phenomenon psychologically. If we could say it's an indicator, yes, of chronic stress, but not of acute stress. It's different with anxiety is that anxiety is already a disorder, medical disorder that has a very difficult reversibility. It's going to need more attention. And there's, there are lots of types of anxiety as well that clinically can be differentiated. I don't want to talk about this very much, but in terms of uh, how lasting it is, the impact is a lot bigger. And for depression, um, for example, being sad sometimes is confused with depression, but depression has to do with a problem in the way your brain works and your nervous system work. It's not only a mood, that you're sad or you're lacking energy. No, it's a disease that goes beyond the control of the person. And just like burnout, it's less reversible. I don't know if uh, that was uh, clear enough. Personally, I think yes, I don't know. Uh, and this is my personal view, the origin in the fact burnout usually is related to working conditions while anxiety and depression and stress can have their origins in other causes that are not necessarily related to working conditions. And this is why I agree with you for this debate that Schoenfer has that says that burnout and depression are the same thing. And that it doesn't, it's not worth talking about burnout. And I think he ignores the origin of burnout is different from the origin of depression. And I also think something important that we need to uh, say here is, and that has to do with what you were talking about, and explains the difference in prevalence. Some people understand burnout as just being tired, or emotionally or physically. And so what they measure is how tired you are physically, but they don't measure the three components that are usually associated and are called as burnout syndrome. And that explains, as you were saying, not only the definition of what is understood as burnout, but the way you measure it and you define where it's you consider someone is sick or not. Okay. Aquí, eh, hay otra pregunta que dice, Perdóname un segundo. Okay, let me read here. It says, en las empresas es necesario aplicar. It says, in companies, we need to apply some questionnaires or can it be diagnosed with other triangulation of information? Is it applied to the whole company or a specific area where you see problems? That's a good question. 
deciden hacer There are companies that decide to do these measurements regularly and of course it's important to include burnout in this logic of the orange light that I talked about and some of those are only carried out in certain departments they do probabilistic sampling but the problem with this or only doing it in certain departments is that we can lose the sight of the whole picture of the symptoms in the whole company and there are some departments that have little participants that are excluded from the sample and that's where the problem is or there might be people who don't want to participate they don't want to participate because they have too much work and then that's precisely where the cases that we sure detect are located. So as tools, yes, in the in the surveys we carried out, um, we do mention some of these symptoms. I think they can also be used as indicators of burnout, or we should add uh, questions regarding this phenomenon. And as I was saying, preferably as much as you can in the company, not only something representative, a generalized because otherwise we're not going to know how the situation is for the people so faking talking about faking just to close this burnout has been studied from these tools with that is a control social desirability which is this phenomenon of wanting to make a good impression or if you want to fake it for example in all of the validity studies what they have shown is that surveys consider a, an error, error margin of possible cases and they're predicting it's good. So we need to see these as tools, measurement tools and not as diagnostic instruments that are really like a thermometer that are going to tell us if someone has something. So that's why I was mentioning those are tools that give us an idea but that have been validated and that logic it's very different difficult that a hundred percent of the people are lying but it has been proven you can rely on this and if we have a couple of cases in the diagnosis we are already controlling for this psychometrically thank you arturo here we have another question that I think has to do with this. I'm going to read it because I am not completely sure that it has been answered. Can we be confused in burnout with associated diagnosis with disorders that are not related to working conditions? And if this could be causing the companies, don't look at it as something that is their business. Yes, something that by nature happens also is that even talking about disorders, if we talk about mental disorders, symptoms for many of these um, are shared. So you have symptoms for anxiety and depression within anxiety itself. We have generalized anxiety or phobias. They have shared symptoms. And so this makes it difficult to differentiate and this is why we have clinical criteria that psychiatrically and psychologically can differentiate what the person has and in that uh, measure talking about these disorders i don't know how it is in colombia but in mexico we do ask to have a screening of these symptoms so that at first we can find those that say that the worker has something and then the company is obliged to channel that that is what the law says then the, the next part is individual attention so for these disorders we need to have individual attention where you diagnose if it's anxiety or depression or a phobia and uh, you require personalized attention why should the company care well as we said, if someone is, is sick, and we will continue to say this, someone who is sick and has a mental disease is in not just a light mood problem. They are sick and their productivity is going to be lowered and their life quality and everything. We also have another chart that mentions their its own criteria and it has to do, it's not the same as burnout. Yes, they do share some symptoms, 
but they are not the same. So I also continue to talk about burnout as an alteration that happens before disease. It's not stress, but it's not a disease. Thank you. I have two questions here. The first one is if there is evidence of a relation between procrastination and burnout syndrome or personality characteristics and burnout. Yes. Well, procrastination, we haven't found. I haven't seen any study for this, but if we understand a problem of how effective your performance is, that is related to burnout, without a doubt. We have found that productivity and performance levels quantitatively and qualitatively have been finished. And so in the case of personality, yes, there are several studies that show the relation between personality and burnout. But the correlations uh, usually are qualitatively not very well balanced. They are kind of biased. Yes, it, it seems that it contributes, but not as much as the organizational conditions. That's what we have so far regarding scientific evidence. Someone asks Arturo how leadership impacts burnout. Well, as I was saying, something that happens in some studies that we have carried out in Mexico, one of the most important predictors for burnout that has to do with um, the load, workload is the most important. Then the second more important one is strict supervision. An authoritarian leader, a leader that is not considerate, a leader that supervises their workers Stockingly, then that is uh, just stock for burnout. If, if I had to choose between the most important predictors, I would choose these two workload and strict supervision. No, that too have to do with good leadership. A leader that designs, organizes uh, its teams has to know this. Okay. Uh, excuse me, please. Yeah. I realized I was <laughs> silent. Okay, Arturo. They are asking someone said, what can you recommend to intervene the tiredness that of course the medical personnel is experiencing today before the impossibility of real work, of, of real uh, rest from if I understand the question correctly, okay, if you understood it, continue. Yeah, um, this is what was happening. They are calling me from the health ministry here in Mexico and telling me, hey, Arturo, we are seeing that there is a feeling of extreme tiredness between the medical personnel in the COVID situation. What do you recommend? Well, let them rest, right? <laughs> let them rest because yeah, they're, they're working hours, 16 hours a day, they work seeing patients of COVID with the emotional demands that this implies. But, but they said, okay, that's difficult for them to rest. Well, yeah, there are no other options. We cannot solve a problem without looking at the root causes. So it's as simple as that. There's no magic solution. You cannot just solve this without looking at the causes. And the most successful me measures that have been published is just this, a design where we have rotation of personnel that allows them to rest. So we, they have their material resources that they need to cope with these demands. Of course, sometimes more personnel in certain strategic areas. Those are organizational interventions that we have uh, been talking about in previous talks and that we will continue to push for. That's the root cause. Uh, does meditation help? Uh, yeah, it, it helps, but if they continue to have this extenuating demand, the effect of the interventions is going to be temporary. So if you want 
to have something longer term, you're going no to idea. have to look at the root causes. There's no other choice. Viviola, if I may, just a second uh, to extend this question because it's something that has, we have seen here in Colombia regarding the situation of being tired, uh, the personnel is exhausted. And in Colombia, we hear the same. We see they are exhausted. What can we do? And I 100% agree with what, what you say. They have to rest. They have to de have a more time for rest. But we have to look at the fact that we have a public emergency. We do not have enough personnel. We don't have more people to hire because there simply isn't. And so one of the things I say is, OK, because of the atypical situation that we have, and temporarily, we could think about trying to help those workers to reduce other type of demands, maybe family issues or logistics or element or their feeding or uh, commuting or something like that. So I have recommended that your workers shouldn't worry about commuting from their homes to their work. Reduce at least that stress or get them a uh, transportation. If you have the ability to have a daycare for their kids or people who help uh, assistants who can help uh, these workers with their errands, for example, at least help them reduce other demands while we have this situation. Um, what do you think if this could help a little uh, bit with this? Yeah, Sebastian, definitely. When I was talking about letting them rest, I what I really mean is the strategy we have around the conditions that are generating this. Of course, someone that has burnout hasn't rested because of the number and complexity of the demands that they face. So if we identify where that burnout comes from, we are going to have a higher impact. And what I'm telling them in the hospital center, in the, in the hospital sector, as happens in many companies, something as basic as the profiles of the job. The, Functions of everyone are in a manual, but when you go to the practice, it is completely disorganized. And this brings us back to work organization. So there may be groups of medical personnel that because of the transition of a hospital that was focused on other type of care and attention to becoming a COVID hospital, it implied a lot of organizational changes that were not planned. And so we found people that had a lot of loads and some people that were getting bored. So it was, there was a complete imbalance there. That's what I meant. When I talk about resting is probably some are getting tired and other, others are not because of how the work is organized. And I could give you a lot of examples about this, of how many of the solutions, you just have to look at the procedures and the planning of the flow of productive processes that can solve this burnout. And uh, of course, this also includes strategies of external things that are external to work. What if you hire people who, who live two hours away from work? Okay, well, those two hours away with the traffic are also a part of their demands that they have. And so other things, personal things they might, might be facing that maybe are not the responsibility of the company, I have always said, but they should also look at them because as human beings, it's very hard to just lose your house hat and come to the company and become someone else, right? It's some, we are human beings, so we cannot do that. We are no robots to compartmentalize like this. Um, aquí hay una pregunta. Uh, we have a question that Arturo, it says, uh, let me read it to you. It says, is it possible to have a high level of engagement and at the same time having burnout? So having someone who is committed and but also burned out? A very good question. Yes, this has been a part of the debate. But right now, what the evidence, empirical evidence has shown is that it seems that this idea of a one 
phenomenon that has two sides is not idoneous, it's not ideal. The World Health Organization has said this, being healthy is not the lack of disease, it's not just a coin with the two faces that are completely the opposite, right? It's There's a variability of the presence of this phenomenon in our lives. So. Of course, we have some elements that may have been linked to the disease and others that are related to health, as well as like mentally, we cannot say that someone that doesn't have depression, they are happy. We cannot say that, right? It's, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, someone who doesn't have burnout, not necessarily is engaged, right? Um, even though some scientists have tried to promote this vision, scientific evidence does not promote this. There seem to be dynamic states where we can have burnout, then suddenly some moments of uh, dedication and immersion and that variability happens even though some of the phenomena are more present than the others so yeah there is a negative correlation between them it's not perfect but some of the two uh, ends up dominating more. so it's hard to have both of them too high or too low there are intermittencies but we always have one dominating Okay, so we have a question. If uh, anxiety disorder has uh, burnout, apart from medicine, should you get the person away from the work that caused this? Yeah, if we can show the link between work exposition and anxiety, then yes. Because if we cannot show this link, then we won't even know what to treat, right? But if we can show that link and the magnitude of the effect is demonstrated, so that really great a great part of that anxiety comes from work, then of course you should, as, as with any physical risk, if there is a, a damage in your ear because of a noise exposition, you need to change him uh, stations. Yes, the same here. How to show then that if someone who has burnout, it was work that caused this burn. Yeah, this is why screening uh, is important, continuous screening. Uh, fortunately, thanks to this law, but we had it later than you. I have, I have always said that Colombia is the leadership in, in, in Latin America regarding psychosocial uh, risks. And, and with this platform, you're showing it. We have that culture of surveillance, constant surveillance is important because we have cases like this. There's a worker that says they are anxious and it's because of their job. Uh, this cannot be based on a questionnaire. You have a methodology and a protocol, and in that protocol, you need to include this historic data. See how that worker did in the content surveillance and in the previous um, studies. And if they had exposition uh, the last time, and the last time before that, and they showed burnout and uh, and this trend is clear that obviously it, this means that there was a previous process uh, to get to this um, orange light, as I say, and nothing changed and then he developed anxiety. So for another worker, it could be depression or high blood pressure, or whatever. It, this is not homogeneous. It depends on the vulnerabilities of each person. That's clear, of course. Arturo, I, I, I want to say something here. As you were saying, in Colombia, we do have the protocol. It's called a protocol for qualifying uh, stress-related diseases. And by law, you have to uh, apply this protocol. A doctor has to apply it uh, with the support of a specialist a psychologist. So it's a very specialized process and it's a very complex process. And I want to have the specific professionals and, and follow a series of procedures. What I always say to companies is, the best you can do is warranty your measurements. If you measure frequently and have all of the data, in the eventuality that we have something like this, you can present all of the data, whether to confirm that it, it came from work or to prove that it wasn't, right? But it is very specialized and it has to do only with the 
doctor and a specialized uh, psychologist, for example, at least in Colombia. Arturo, they are asking if the situation of burnout can be as extreme as for a person to kill themselves. No. No, I think that suicide is linked much more with depression as a disease. But clinically, so far, I haven't heard of excessive burnout that can lead to that. I insist the previous the previous stage to disease is burnout. If burnout continues for a considerable amount of time, there you're going to have your first put in any disorder. So from the prevention point of view, uh, the severity of burnout is lower than the disorder that can have irreversible consequences. Yeah, I remember hearing uh, Christina Maslach insist that prevention healing burnout is complicated and lengthy. And that's why she says prevention, prevention, prevention. Look at the, your working conditions, carry out measurements because once the person reaches that level of feeling really burned out, then the next step is just right, right around the corner, right? The disability or health or disease. So, so prevention, 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 right? Okay. Um, okay. I think. Estoy aquí leyendo preguntas que acaban de llegar. Reading questions that are just uh, getting in. Someone says, uh, with a demand control model, can you identify burnout or control it? Yes, of course. It's what, as I said before, just as with the orange light, remember that first comes the yellow light, which is exposition. If I have uh, workers with high demands and low control, that is a yellow light. They might have some initial symptoms of burnout in, in those workers. So that's why it's important to, from primary prevention exposition to conditions, if we have burnout, then secondary prevention, we need to start to taking care of those people, uh, including in individual complementary strategies, because meditation can help, but it's not the only way, right? Okay, Arturo, I think that well, I, I wasn't able to read all of the questions. I, I tried to choose the ones that had to do more with what you presented today or with things that are not going to be talked about later because some questions have to do with organizational interventions, but we are going to focus on this later on in another special session that Laura Cunet is going to have, centered specifically on the one hand on organizational consequences, but also on interventions uh, for organizations to prevent not only burnout, but other types of problems that we have been talking about recently in this seminar. Last week, we talked about physical problems, cardiovascular problems. And next week, we are going to talk about other types of problems that are psychological and behavioral, for example, um, working conditions. I asked, someone asked if burnout and workplace harassment are the same. And I said, I answered them here that workplace harassment is a condition, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the same because burnout is a consequence, it's a mental state as you described because of some conditions. But Arturo, thank you very, very much for having uh, taken the time to come here. I know you have a lot of responsibility and a lot going on in your life, but I know how experienced you are and your knowledge. And so that's why I insisted you should come here. And thank God you, accept, you accepted the invitation to share with us your knowledge. Thanks a lot. Thanks a million, really. No, it's the contrary, Viviola. I want to thank you infinitely because of this invitation. Really, it's an honor being able to be here because we are leaders in this region, in these topics. It's an honor for me 
being with you and the next uh, the, the other colleagues of these conferences and i congratulate you for this event and this very important platform uh, that we really need in this region so all my love to you Viola. just the same arturo goodbye thank you everyone Viola arturo thank you once more and thank you all of the participants in, in this uh, conference. Please remember that next uh, week, we're going to have another talk. You can be there from 10.45. Uh, again, thank you all and we'll see you next time.